Well, God has been with us today, and uh, he has just really brought a great uh, worship experience for us today. Thank you to all of our, our team that, that uh, volunteers and, and makes all this possible. Uh, every one of you is so uh, valued. I want to pray right now. Father, in this moment, as we move in our, from our service, from uh, this joint expression of worship and song and interaction, Lord, we just want to hear your spirit speak to us as the song has led us to this moment. We want that sweet spirit to be cherished here. And Lord, we want your voice to come now and speak to us. That is what we ask and want. So anoint this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm wondering if I can get Toby's help again. Where are you? And we'll have him right there. We've been... Um, Studying the topic of forgiveness lately. Nassim, are you going to be the other one? Thank you so much. I like to begin my messages. I'll, I'll, I'll get into the, the theme as we develop the message. I like to interact with the young people. I've done this pretty much from the beginning of my ministry. Begin the service with uh, what I call a kid's quiz. And I just like to hear some thoughts uh, from our young people today. Raise your hand. Uh, we'd like to be able to hear it in the microphone. And for those that are watching from home um, and that need it to be uh, go through our sound system. You know, the, the different Bible characters, when you think of Bible characters, you think of different attributes. We, we talked about Noah. You know, he was a shipbuilder, and the Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness, so we know he had those abilities. David was pretty good as a soldier and a, with a slingshot. He could also play the harp. Uh, you know, Daniel being courageous, uh, Ruth being loyal. Uh, so we think of different strengths that Bible characters have. As you think of Jesus, do any of our kids here, as you think of Jesus, what was Jesus really good at? And I saw Isaiah, so let's hear it, Isaiah. He's really good at making stuff. He's very good at making stuff. I like it. Benjamin? Healing people. Healing. He was a pretty good healer, wasn't he? Um, all right, Nico? Carpentry. Carpentry. All right. Never give Nico the mic, Nassim. Ne you hold on to that. You never know what this guy's going to do. Julian. Preaching. Oh, he was a good preacher. These guys, they, go, they know the stories of Jesus. We got a couple more. Abel. Abel's in the back. Everything. Got one everything. Every ah, <laughs> that's cheating. Everything. My, oh, my. Sean, we'll come to you. I appreciate Nassim and Toby running all over. But we'll go right here first. Go ahead. Just giving, making food. Making food? He did. He made bread and multiplied the fishes. Is that what I heard her say? Hey, I love it. I love it. All right, over here. A couple more, a couple more, and then we're going to have to move on. But this is great. Who do we have? It? Rakezia? Say it again. Is the black mic uh, not working all of a sudden? Toby, are you pushing buttons? No. Okay, say it one more time, Ketsia. Forgiveness. You gotta, you gotta let, you gotta let it out, young lady. I don't know. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Ah, she's thinking about the topic. All right. Miracles. Miracles. Okay, one more. Just one more. Is, is there anyone? One more. Okay, we'll do these two last. We've got one over here, and one over here. Teaching. Teaching. All right, last one. Loving people. Loving people. We got some great kids here. Thank you guys so much. Jesus was good at so many things, wasn't he? And you guys mentioned some of them. I think he was a master carpenter. Now, the Bible doesn't go into great detail about his life before his ministry began, but let's, let's be honest, right? He was the creator of the universe, right? The Bible says all things were made through Jesus Christ. So I think he was a master carpenter. Uh, all right, he apprenticed under his father, Joseph, who we know was a carpenter. I think Jesus knew how to handle a saw and hammers and wood. I think he, we could, I think without hesitation, we can say he was a master carpenter. He was a storyteller and a teacher. He was able to take the great mysteries and, and miracles of heaven and, and make them understandable through his parables and his teaching. Now, there's a lot of relationship between teaching and preaching. Preaching is kind of taking the, 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 uh, the, the 
verses of the Bible, the passages of Scripture, and making them understandable. And he was able to preach, and people never heard someone preach with such great authority and power. We know he was a great preacher because his sermons were probably only 20 minutes, and I haven't got there yet, folks. I'm working on it. I can't. And John's working on it, too. <laughs> He was a master. Now, again, he wasn't just good at these. He was a master. And someone said it over here, too. There was no condition that he saw that he could not have compassion on and bring healing. He could raise the dead. He could open up ears and eyes. He could make those who are lame and couldn't walk. He could make them walk. And the miracles beyond that, he could calm storms. He could divide the fish and the loaves. He was a master of healing and a master of the environment. But I think it was Ketia. Who really came, oh, and she had some help, apparently. That's good. One thing that Jesus was also a master of, he was a master forgiver. I'm using that word specifically. We could say redeemer. We could say savior. We could say reconciler. There's other ways and other language to the uh, idea of forgiveness. But Jesus was a master at forgiving even the most hopeless situation when everyone else had given someone else up as being a lost cause. Jesus was a master forgiver. Do you agree? Four people over here agree. I love it. Heard it. Now I want you to look at this list for just a second. To a degree, all of us can be some of these things. We may not master them. No matter how you know, right-brained you are, everyone has a creative element in them to a degree. So we can all be creative, but we might not be able to be a master of creativity. All of us need to tell our stories. All of us teach to some degree. We're all called to present the gospel and be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. All of us should be preachers, even if we haven't mastered it. All of us can bring healing to a degree, uh, offer a word of encouragement, you know, be of a, of a kind spirit to bring reconciliation. All of us can do all of these things to a degree, but we can't master them all like Jesus. But the one that all of us can master and learn from Jesus, the one that all of us should aspire to, to have the absolute mastery of, is forgiveness. There is no excuse for any believer to proclaim, I cannot forgive as Jesus forgave. I cannot have that ability. We may not have the other masteries, be master preachers, master storytellers, but all of us, as children of the Lord, who've accepted Jesus Christ and invited His Holy Spirit into our hearts, all of us can and should be growing, growing into becoming master forgivers. The Bible says, this is after John 3.16 and John 3.17, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I put a little insert in your bulletins. Maybe you've glanced at it. It's in a different color. Mine's white. Yours might be in a different color, maybe purple. We've been studying forgiveness, and we're going to continue to study forgiveness for the next few weeks in the church. And I just jotted down a few of the principles that we have already explored to some degree. You may find this interesting. Forgiveness is not as easy to define as you might think. And, and when, I, when I first started this presentation, you know, I talked about if we just keep forgiveness to that superficial level of feeling bad and saying you're sorry and not doing it again, if we just keep it at that level, now there's truth to that. We should feel bad. We should apologize. All those things are true. But if we leave it at that fairly shallow level, we will not experience the depth and power that God wants to pour into our lives and what He wants us to extend to others through the ministry of forgiveness. So I wanted to, to spend more time on this attribute. And so these are just a list of 10 of the things we've looked at so far. I'm going to give you one more uh, this morning before I get any further in my, in my presentation. Forgiveness does not mean restoring a relationship to the way it was before. Forgiveness does not mean restoring a relationship to the way it was before. It does not mean that. That is not forgiveness. Forgiveness means improving the relationship beyond where it was before. Let me give you an analogy. If you were to build a bridge 
and that bridge is standing, but a storm came along, or, or uh, the great winds came, or maybe a big truck went over that bridge, and the bridge was to fail. The bridge was to collapse. Would you, as an engineer, go to that bridge and say, you know what? We need to rebuild that bridge exactly the same way as it was before. You wouldn't do that. You would be foolish. You would say that bridge has failed. The status of what that bridge was is not satisfactory to the need of what that bridge needs to do. You would want to build that bridge stronger, right? The same is true with forgiveness. Forgiveness means building that relationship stronger because the status that you had with someone or the status that you had with the Lord before you experienced uh, your fall or the offense or the offense to you shows that that status was insufficient. It was insufficient. Forgiveness means building relationships stronger. This is why Gandhi said that forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. It's the weak who cannot forgive. And the more you allow God to forgive you, the stronger your relationship with God gets. He doesn't just restore you back to your status that you were before. He builds you up. You grow more and more into his likeness. And the same is true when we interact with one another. God doesn't want you just to get back to the status you had when someone broke faith with you, when someone offended you, when someone turned their back on you and you've been painfully separated. As you work on that process of reconciliation, your relationships will go stronger. That's why forgiveness is so powerful. A community that forgives is a strong community, amen? The world says it's weak. The world says it's admitting faults. The world says don't do it and look at the condition of the world. It's falling apart. Are you testifying, sister? We, there's all kinds of circumstances. It does not mean that you go, simply go back to the way things were. There can, and, and get the tape. We, we've studied this to a degree, so you can get caught up. And we're going to continue delving. I know there's circumstances some of you may be thinking, well, what about this? Does this apply to that? We will develop, uh, delve more into these circumstances. But as the process of forgiveness is working in your life, no, it doesn't mean that uh, the, the past is not relevant and it just is, has no more bearing. Um, so, We can talk more about that. I want you to notice this passage from Paul in Colossians. He says this, Now God, and this is the New International Version, by the way, Now God has reconciled you, and again, the language of forgiveness, the language of redemption, same idea here. God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy. Now, anytime in the scriptures you see you and holy in the same sentence, you should pay attention, right? Wait a minute. Me, holy, those two ideas belong together? How does that happen? How does that work? He's going to present, he's going to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Isn't that a wonderful promise? He's going to present you holy. Are you holy? Right now? By whose merits? Who are you depending on? Because of Christ's physical sacrifice and death, God's going to present you holy. You're going to be without blemish and free from accusation. Notice the qualifier here, though. If. If. If you continue in your faith, if you allow the transforming work of God, the promise of God to continually transform you and change you into His likeness, if you continue in that faith, establish and firm, not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the good news. God wants to reconcile us. He wants us to be reconciled with our fellow man. But there's a responsibility we have beyond that moment of reconciliation to allow the process of forgiveness to continue to develop our faith as we grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So it is a day by day, moment by moment. This is why I like the, the Robert Frost quote, who he said, to be social is to be forgiving. To live in an environment with other people acknowledges that people will fail you. And if you're uncomfortable with that, if you can't accept the fact that at times in your life people will let you down, you're just going to become a hermit and stay in your, your little world, and you're never going to be able to interact with people. To be social is to be forgiving. To drive on the roads of Arizona, 
you got to be pretty forgiving. Or else it's a stressful experience. <laughs> right, honey? Oh, wait. Uh, uh, no, I'll have to ask for forgiveness later. We want to learn from the master, don't we? So we are going to do that this morning by looking at a time where he had to be faced with a great trial with a woman, a trap, and words in the dust. It was a setup. It was a ruse. It was a trap. Now, she thought it was strange that someone would be at her door at this time of day. I mean, the sun had barely risen, and her customers usually came at night. But there he stood in the doorway, and he had money, and he was adamant, so she let him in. Now, no one could have been more shocked and horrified than this woman when only moments later, armed men stormed into her home, threw open her bedroom door, and arrested her. Her customer silently scampered away, but rough hands seized upon her, and she barely had time to grab a simple garment before she was hauled out into the street. Now, she recognized those who had taken her. They were Jews, led by scribes and Pharisees. Some of them she even recognized as her former customers, but they didn't look at her. They were taking her somewhere. Their minds were elsewhere. In just moments, it became clear just where they were taking her, and her heart sank when she saw it. Shocked as she was at her arrest and her mind reeling with the thought of her punishment, the sight of that building ahead was more than she could bear. They were taking her to the one place where sinners like her were not welcome. They were going to the temple. Yes, the temple. Only holy men and righteous worshipers go to the temple. An adulterous woman like her would not find mercy there. A prostitute would never be accepted among the pure and blameless people there. Going to the temple could only mean humiliation, condemnation, and possibly death. These were her thoughts as they approached the magnificent temple mount. They passed through the outer passageways, ascended the 12 steps of the lower gate, and entered the hall of the outer court. The sun was still low on the eastern sky as the morning shined on, yet the temple was already filled with early morning worshipers and priests, and temple servants mulled about attending to their various duties. Jesus was at the temple this morning. He was teaching and surrounded by his listeners. Jesus was immediately visible to the woman as she was led into that court, and when she saw him, she froze. Why was he here? She had seen Jesus before. She had heard him teaching and heard about his power. And she feared even more that her life was about to end. A righteous teacher like Jesus, one who claimed to be the Messiah, the very Son of God, surely he would not like to have her in his presence. Surely he was the one who had arranged for her arrest and was now bringing her to trial. Now, Jesus' teachings were interrupted when all of a sudden the quiet and dull tones of the temple courtyard were disrupted by the loud shouts and rough voices as an anxious mob dragged a pitiful woman into the midst of the temple yard. The mob was scribes and Pharisees who had arrested this woman. They were dressed in their finest religious garb with miters on their head, but the woman barely was loosely clad in rags. With a violent thrust, she is thrown to the ground in front of Jesus. With a cry and a thump, she crumples to the ground. Her sobbing is muffled only by her hand as it covers her mouth. Now the talking and chattering had stopped as a piercing silence now envelops the scene, save for the soft whimpering of this sinful woman. All eyes are on the mob and on this Jesus. Those who'd been listening to Jesus have stepped away from him so that a clear lane is made between him and the rabble that clearly has some kind of business to conduct with him. Jesus stands before them. As he watched the woman drug in, his heart broke with compassion for her due to her shame, but now his eyes are fixed only on those who created such a scene. With scarcely a glance at the pathetic heap that now sobs at his feet, he fixes his eyes on those who are attempting to destroy him. He knows they don't care about her. He knows they're simply using her. He knows their plot. He who searches the heart and knows the depths of the soul clearly perceives their goal. 
They seek to destroy him and are using this destitute and miserable harlot to accomplish their designs. As you recall, earlier in his ministry, Jesus, with righteous indignation, had driven out the merchants and money changers from the temple. Divinity had flashed through humanity as he overturned their tables and cried out against them for defiling his father's house. In terror, those who'd, been, who, those who'd made the temple a market for profit fled from him in an attempt to hide from this man who with great authority was driving them out. Now again, Christ's eyes are filled with anger and wrath as he despises the actions of these would-be teachers of the law and these so-called guardians of the faith. Onlookers begin to draw near in curiosity to this scene. The silence is deafening. Finally, a Pharisee, the leader, the eldest of the bunch, calmly, even smugly, holding the lapels of his vesture, steps forward and says, Rabbi, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? Even the curious onlookers could not have helped to miss the sarcasm dripping in the voice of the Pharisee as he asked Jesus, what then do you say? As if it was a legitimate question. Jesus had never taken his eyes off of this murderous group. His heart is filled with anger, but at the same time, it's filled with pain. He has compassion on these people. He knows that Satan is using them and that their own souls are in danger of damnation. Without speaking a word, Jesus simply, quietly, stoops down and with his finger, meticulously begins to write. The scribes and Pharisees glance at each other, not quite sure how to interpret this gesture. Again, the leaders step forward, drawing closer to Jesus and repeating their question, Rabbi, what should we do? Should we follow the law as Moses commanded us and stone this sinner, or should we not? Now the woman, hearing the stern language and the word stone, whimpers and trembles beneath the feet of this crowd. She does not look up nor perceive the actions of Jesus. Standing up, Jesus looks again at this rabble. His stare is almost too much to bear. As some drop their gaze from him and turn away, as, as others sheepishly draw back and try to hide behind the more emboldened defenders. With clarity and strength, in the silence of the temple, Jesus' voice fills the yard. He who is without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. Pausing for just a moment, and again, piercing his gaze at any who dared to make eye contact with him, Christ stoops back down to continue his dusty notation. In disbelief and confusion, the head Pharisee again steps forward to comment, but words fail him as he realizes that he cannot argue against such a point. Moses' law had demanded that it be the witnesses of the sin that be the first to cast stones. How can he as a Pharisee admit that he had gone into the home of a harlot and witnessed such a sin? The Pharisee begins to stutter a response, but seeing that Jesus is only interested in his writing, he finally stops. At last, his gaze is drawn to the ground where Christ has been writing with his finger, his head cocked slightly to the side, as he reads the words on the floor. The first word causes him pause. Conspiracy. Conspiracy? What does this have to do with anything? But Jesus had written other words, and he kept reading, hatred, cruelty, malice, deceit. What do these words mean? The Pharisee read on, strife, rebellion, violence, greed, murder. There in the dust of the temple courtyard, the architect of the human heart has revealed the sinful motivations and desires of, his own, of the woman's attackers and accusers of this adulterous woman. At last it becomes clear to the Pharisee that they had failed. Defeat washes over his face, over the face of this pretentious and hollow leader. There, written in the dust, were his sins. Faced with this powerful revelation and repulsed by the wisdom and virtue of Jesus, he turns and without a word, he exits out of the temple. The rest of the mob watches their leader do this in concern. This Pharisee was the eldest of them. He should have known what to say and what to do. Why was he leaving? And what did he read that silenced his protestations? 
A few others now take charge and approach this man riding in the dust to see what it was that had stopped their leader. And one by one, they file by the bent Savior and read the writing. And one by one, they follow their leader out of the temple. The curious onlookers, confused at this sight, sense that it's time for them to depart this scene as well. And as the Scripture says, Jesus and the woman were left alone. By now the woman has stopped crying, but her heart is still racing as she dreads and wonders her fate. Her head is still hung low, looking only at the ground before her. She has not dared raise her eyes. Her breath now stops as again silence falls all around her. Jesus stands for his feet to his feet and now for the first time lets his gaze rest upon this humiliated form beneath him. He could have just walked away. He could have scolded her for getting herself into this situation. He could have condemned her. But looking down upon her, he speaks the first words that he would speak to her and says, Woman, where are they? In our modern language, we may have heard him say, Miss, do you see, young lady, did no one condemn you? His words are gentle and kind. For the first time since this horror began for her, a glimpse of hope sparks in her heart. Her mind is still doubtful, though. Her emotions are in shambles. At any time, she'd been expecting to feel the stones strike her body. But now she hears the soft words of this man they call the Messiah. Where are your accusers? She turns her head to the left, then to the right. Again, her breath catches as she realizes that the crowd is empty and there's no one with her except Jesus. And then slowly at first, she looks up and fixes her eyes on Jesus. She looks on this man and she sees his eyes. Standing before her is Christ. And in his eyes and in his face, she sees all the power and terror and beauty and grace of heaven itself. She sees a Savior. Can you see him? What does his face look like when she looked up at him? Her hair is matted to her face from her sweat and tears and the dust of the temple floor. The eyes of Jesus have changed. There's no frown, no anger, no criticism in his eyes. Instead, there's compassion, pity, kindness, and even could it be, is it possible, forgiveness? The morning sun shines brightly on the Son of God, illuminating his form and transforming his presence into that of living light. And the question still rings in her ears, has no one condemned you? Slowly she manages a reply, no louder than a whisper. No one, Lord. It was as much a question as it was a statement. She knows her accusers have gone, but she yet wonders, what will he do? No one, Lord, that is, if you don't. Will he accuse her? Will he condemn her? What will Jesus do? As though in a dream, her eyes are fixed on him. Stooping down one last time, Jesus lowers himself and comes face to face with this disheveled woman. He moves the matted hair out of her face and looks through her eyes into her deepest soul. Her heart stops as she understands that she's looking into no ordinary human eyes. These truly are the eyes of God. They are eyes of unconditional love. Jesus calmly and clearly looking deep into her whole, into her whole soul says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What just happened? Is this possible? Disbelief floods her soul. She has gone from death 
to life. Amazement and wonder overcomes her. Christ, with only love and mercy in his face, dabs away the last tear still clinging to her cheek, draws her to her feet, but now her eyes are filling with tears again. This time they're tears of joy. She can't believe that she has been forgiven, and she knows with every fiber of her being that he can forgive her and reconcile her to God. Surely he is the Son of God. Joy, peace, an overwhelming sense of liberty overtake her. She is forgiven and renewed by grace. Now, he had told her, go and sin no more, but she didn't want to go now. She wanted to be with him, cling to him, devote her whole life to him. Yet, after many sobs of joy, words of confession, and embraces of thanks, she, she obeys his word and departs to a life that has been forever changed. Now, by now, curious onlookers have wandered back to the temple and have watched this final scene unfold. But then they observed one final curiosity before Jesus would conclude this episode. Walking back over to the dusty words on the ground, Jesus looked again at his inscription. The words had continued, spite and brutality, vengeance, treachery, and jealousy. But there is one more word that he had written there. It, too, was a sin of one of those present. But taking his foot and dragging it across the tile floor, he erased the word adultery and removed it from the temple floor forever. Then glancing up towards heaven and with a smile, Jesus now turns again to the crowd that has reentered the temple and resumed his teaching right from where he left off. And with the morning sun still gleaming over his shoulder, he spoke the words, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. 700 years earlier, God had spoken through Isaiah the prophet and given the words, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions, and I will not remember your sins. He promised to wipe them out. He was the master forgiver. He was on a mission of redemption. And we need to learn from the Master. Amen? Forgive as you have been forgiven. Bless as you have been blessed. Love as you have been loved. The story in the Bible is not simply there for us to marvel at God's own love and forgiveness towards sinners, but so that we too could be transformed by His grace and be master forgivers like he was. Would that we would all learn from the master. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we th we're so thankful for these moments that are recorded in Scripture that illustrate powerful times when your plan and your power overcame the accusations of the devil and thwarted the traps of those who sought to destroy you. We know the enemy still seeks to destroy your people. And Lord, it's through the power of forgiveness that we can thwart the plan of the enemy. It can restore lost people. And in the same moment, it restores us by allowing your power to, to flow through us, Lord. Lord, help us to learn from these stories. Help us to meditate on them and to ask ourselves the question, how can we also have the power of forgiveness in our hearts? We want to be master forgivers. Help us, dear Father. We know that you want to make that possible in our lives. 
Thank you for this moment that we could spend with you. Bless everyone who's here and help us to continue in the spirit of joy and fellowship the rest of this Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.